All right. Well, it's a real pleasure to introduce um, Professor Gill, Rick Gill, to you. Um, I asked him if he had anything other than what was on his website he wanted me to use to introduce himself, and he said, just say, I'm Rick. I love BYU and the environment, and uh, I thought that was um, uh, nice of him, but I had a few more things to say. Um, I did pull from his website a brief bio that I'll read to you. Richard Gill developed an interest in ecology as a child while exploring the forests and seashores of Washington State. And this attraction to wild places motivated Dr. Gill to study conservation biology as an undergraduate at BYU and to receive a PhD in ecology from Colorado State University. His PhD research on plant soil interactions and dryland ecosystems supervised by Andy Burke dovetailed well with his postdoctoral research on plant physiological ecology with Rob Jackson, Jackson at Duke University. Dr. Gill returned home to Washington in his first faculty position at Washington State University, which is also the Cougars. And there he pursued research on global change ecology, studying the impacts of changes in atmospheric CO2, temperature, and drought. And in 2008, he joined the faculty of his alma mater here at BYU as an associate professor of biology, and he teaches conservation biology here in, and in the general and honor, um, honors education curriculum. I've had the privilege of team teaching with Rick, and um, it was a singular uh, honor to do so with him. I, I, um, I sort of thought that maybe my contribution to the class was the humanities side that he might need a little help with, and I uh, quickly discovered that Rick is a very um, astute reader of literature and, and uh, religion and theology and teaches it better than I do. So, um, and unfortunately, I was not able to complement that with anything on the biological side. So it was kind of a, a wash as far as I was concerned, but Rick did a great job. Um, and it was a real honor to, to learn from him. I've also seen him talk about climate change in the public sphere um, with an, um, you know, tough questions being thrown at him. And uh, if you if you want to know and understand climate change science, uh, Rick is is the person to ask uh, your questions to. He's he's really um, very thoughtful, uh, very uh, capable of explaining um, science to non specialists, and um, he's just a, a wonderful human being on top of all of that. And so it's a it's a pleasure to introduce uh, uh, my good friend and our wonderful colleague, uh, Rick Gill. So, Rick. Well, I appreciate all the, the good work that, that George has done in, in arranging this seminar series. And, and one of the, the most important things for me is to, to be at BYU and work with, with amazing people like George and the, and the rest of, of the faculty that are part of, of the Environmental Ethics Initiative and, and to be with, with, with uh, amazing students as well. Um, and so not too long ago, I came back um, from sabbatical, and one of the things that I learned on sabbatical that, that I um, promised myself that I was going to, to bring into to what I, I do is the ability to say no, right? I, I wanted to, to make sure that every additional thing that people asked me to do that I was ready to say no to. And I had been home for about two weeks and George asked me um, to, to speak in this seminar series. And, and I was absolutely prepared to exercise my right to say no. And, and I spent an evening thinking about it and realized that I may have something to say, right? And, and that, that you should say no to most things, but occasionally when you have something um, that may be meaningful, as, as I prayed about this, I, I thought that maybe there's something um, that somebody needs to hear. Um, and so, so with that, um, I wanted to, to talk about um, climate change and the way that um, the roots of, of our religion can help inform um, how we respond to, to issues re related to climate change. And, and this is a, a different venue for me to speak in. The, the professionally, I'm an ecologist. And, and, um, and ecology comes from the Greek word oikos, which means home. Um, and, and it really is focused on the way that organisms interact with their environment. And that's what I do professionally. And, and the, um, there's this emerging discipline, or actually it's a, a fairly well-established discipline of religion and, and ecology. And, and what's interesting to me is to sort of break that apart and, and think about it a little bit, because oftentimes uh, we um, 
consider religion and the study of home and consider how religious traditions help us to understand the environment. We may ask ourselves how Hinduism and Islam and Christianity may differ in um, how they orient humanity towards the environment. Um, but, but from a scientific standpoint, it's just as, an interest, just as interesting to consider how the environment has shaped our religious traditions, right? How growing up in a specific place and, and experiencing specific things has influenced our religion. And, and then, then finally, how the, those things interact with one another and the feedbacks that exist between religious practice and the environment and how that environment responds to that religious practice. And, and, and so, so what what I'm going to spend my time today doing is focusing about, uh, about how environment has shaped our religious tradition and created what I would call a dryland theology and how that dryland theology informs how we might respond to climate change. Um, and, and so, so the, the origin of, of Judeo-Christian tradition um, lies in the Near East uh, as well as, as Islam. Um, and and so, so to orient you, we've got Egypt down here with, with the Nile River. Um, uh, we've got the, the coast of the Mediterranean. We've got the, the, the Negev Desert here in, in the, the center. Um, we've got the, the Fertile Crescent that comes up and around. We, we've heard uh, a lot about Syria lately, uh, Lebanon, Iraq, um, the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers. Um, and what's fascinating about this is just how biologically diverse it is and, and biophysically diverse. And part of that is, is in large part because of water and the availability of water. Um, so, so this is, is a map of that same region and what, here we have differences in rainfall um, from the, the desert um, where they, they receive um, much less than 10 inches of rainfall a year. Uh, along the coast and through the, the mountains here, you can get 30, 40, 50 inches a, a, of rain in a year. And so, so over you know, 100 miles, you may go from 30 or 40 inches of rain to nearly nothing. Um, and, and so, so we have the, this con complex landscape on which um, Judeo Christian traditions developed. And there were, are a number of what, what I would call biophysical domains that have shaped the religion that we practice today. Um, and and so, so the first is one, the, the riverine domains. So, so these are areas that otherwise would be desert, but for the fact that they are subsidized by water from elsewhere, right? That there, there's a river running through them, and we see it in our scriptures. So in Psalm 65, it says, Thou visitest the earth and waterest it. Thou greatly enrichest it with the river of God, which is full of water. Thou waterest the ridges thereof abundantly. Thou settlest the furrows thereof. Thou makest it soft with showers. Thou blessest the springing thereof. And, and I might add that we're in the middle of that springing here to, right today. And you, you can imagine the, the joy that this brings the, the psalmist. But, but, but we have the, this idea that um, um, part of our perception of God is a benevolent God. That in a life that would otherwise not be possible, God brings us water, which makes things fruitful. Um, there's this second domain, and the, the shape of it is, is interesting. You've heard of the Fertile Crescent. So, so this is the crescent shape. So this is the rain-fed domain. That's where a, there's a sufficiency of water for agriculture, right? And so uh, among uh, the, the early pr practitioners of uh, the Judeo-Christian um, tradition, this would be the promised land. This is a place where there, there's enough to grow crops. And, and you hear the description here um, in Deuteronomy. It says, For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and depths that spring out of valleys and hills, right? The, the, just this idea of, of having wandered in the wilderness and there's this place that we're going to go where there's going to be enough water to survive, right? It says, a land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey, a land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarceness, thou shalt not lack anything in it. When thou hast eaten and art full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given thee, right? So, so um, it 
complements the, the rivering um, uh, bio, uh, biophysical domain, um, but, but it's something really distinctive, this land of almost excess where, where there's enough. And, and there's a fascinating religious practice that accompanies this um, biophysical domain, though. And, and we see in Leviticus very specific laws that are tied to being part of this land. It says, speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, when you come into the land which I give you, right? So when you finally make it to this promised land, then shall the land keep a Sabbath unto the Lord, right? The, the, the Sabbath tradition is tied to the land of promise. It says, six years thou shalt sow thy field, and six years thou shalt prune thy vineyard, and gather in the fruit thereof. But in the seventh year thou shalt be a Sabbath of rest unto the land, a Sabbath for the Lord. Thou shalt neither sow thy field nor prune thy vineyard, and the Sabbath of the land shall be meat for you. So in spite of the fact you're not gathering from the land, you will be sustained. But there are blessing pr promised to, to those in addition to the landowner. It says... For thee and for thy servant and for thy maid and for thy hired servant and for thy stranger that sojourneth with thee and for thy cattle and for the beasts that are in thy land. That this Sabbath tradition will enrich not just the, the individual who lets their, their crops be fallow, but will it enrich the entire community. Lying in between the rain-fed domain and the riverine domain of the Tigris and the Euphrates is an area where there isn't sufficient rainfall for crops, but th there is forage available. And so the, this is where the pastoral tr um, tradition uh, emerges. And, and this is where we get some of the most um, poetic visions for, from the, the scriptures. We see, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Right? So, so we, we see that in between sort of the extreme of the, the, the rain-fed domain where there's this great abundance, um, where we have the pastoral one well, where you're watched over and cared for by, um, by a shepherd, um, and, and it becomes a really powerful metaphor uh, as God teaches the Israelites. He says, therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my people. Ye have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord. And I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them. Right, the, This command of shepherding those that, lo that are lost and wander. And they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. And then finally, um, we have the, this great desert. And so this is the wilderness of the Old Testament. And, and, and this is a scary place. Um, and, and we see that. Um, but it was in this place that the Israelites were sustained. And it says, Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God. Then thine heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God, who led thee through that great and terrible wilderness. It truly is a terrible place. It's a place where there isn't forage for livestock. There isn't a sufficiency of rainfall to grow crops. Right? The only way you can survive in the wilderness is to be sustained by someone else. And it says, uh, wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, there was no water. Who brought thee forth out of who who brought thee forth water out of the rock of flint? Who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee, that he might prove thee, to do thee good at thy later end. Right? So, so we see that, that in each of these biophysical domains, there, there uh, is something distinctive being taught by God. And, and we can see the exodus, and, and the, the pathway uh, of the exodus takes them out of the riverine domain, through the wilderness, into the pastoral zone, and then finally into the promised land. And, and to, to show you this graphically, right, so, so you know, as a scientist, you've got to throw at least one graph in. And so, so I want to not just impress this upon you in terms of, of what I tell you. I want to show you the actual data. And to understand the data, I, I just have to introduce one way of conceptualizing data. 
Uh, and that is when we think about climate, that there really are two, especially in this part of the world, there are two things that interact in a really meaningful way. One is temperature, the other is rainfall. And so, so we can characterize, so, so this is the average climate in Israel from 80 to 2004. We have um, uh, the month of, of the year on the x-axis and average temperature uh, on the y. And so what you see is in January, it's a little over 10 degrees Celsius. It rises up to about 28 degrees Celsius um, midsummer and then comes back down. It, it, it's um, very temperate. Um, we can look at rainfall as well. And so, so we've got the same x-axis, that this is month of the year, and this is monthly precipitation. And what's really fun about this is that there, there's a way that you can overlay these and get some real insights into the ecology of the place. And that's if you sort of scale this, that for every 10 degrees Celsius increase you have on this axis, you have a 20 millimeter increase on this axis. And why that's meaningful is that for every 10 degrees Celsius increase in temperature, you evaporate about 20 millimeters of water. And so when you overlay these, in the places where precipitation lies above the temperature line, there's an excess of water, right? And that water can be used to grow crops or other things. The, 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 the precipitation that falls below the temperature line is lost to evaporation, right? So, so, so what we see in is Israel is that for um, about six months of the year, starting in October and continuing through about April, there's an excess of rainfall, and that's when they grow their crops, right? This is why it's the promised land. There's a sufficiency of water. So when we actually look at the, the pathway that the Israelites took, right? So this is Goshen or Cairo, and what you see is there isn't a single month out of the year where rain-fed agriculture is possible, right? This is a terrible place to live. And the only reason people can live there is that it's subsidized. It's subsidized by the Nile River. They then enter the wilderness. This is what a, the, the climate is like around Mount Sinai. And it's a truly miserable place, right? The, 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 a horrible place. You move into this pastoral zone, and what you see is that there's a little bit of excess rainfall, enough to grow some forage for, for grazing animals, but not enough for agriculture. And finally, you enter the promised land where the, you know, there's this great abundance of rainfall. And so what we see is the instruction and, and the, the experience of the Israelites, right? It was one of being exposed to subsidy, um, transitioning into a state of complete dependency, to, um, to be taught to shepherd, right, to care for those who are lost and to flock together and to stay together and to be a band, and, and finally into an environment of sufficiency where you celebrate the Sabbath, right? So, so, so we see that, that we can see manifest in a theology, the experience of the landscape. There's, it's amazing to see how much of this influences LDS doctrine, right? So, so whether it's the, the Book of Mormon, which is a very distinctive climate from the Near East, yet the, the grounding of the religious tradition in the Near East um, allows it to, to continue, um, and it actually is exposed again in the early years of the LDS Church um, in the Doctrine and Covenants and other places. And, and there are dozens and dozens of scriptures um, to, to make this point, but, but I just want to share a few of them uh, with you. And so, so we, we see um, the idea of water as a metaphor of su sustaining the, the, the river that flows through um, you know, bring forth as a very fruitful tree which is planted in goodly land by a pure stream that yieldeth much precious fruit, right? It's that access to the subsidy that produces the, the, this precious fruit. And, and it, we see the same thing in Doctrine and Covenants and Second Nephi, uh, Mosiah, right? The, the waters of Mormon are this great place of sustaining, a place of hiding, a place of comfort. Right? And, and again, it's the, this waterway that's subsidized. Um, you could see it as a land of promise, right? Uh, and we did come into a land which we called bountiful because of its much fruit and also wild honey. And all these things were prepared of the Lord that we might not perish. And we beheld the sea, which we called Iriantum, which being interpreted is many waters, 
right? The, the, this um, amazing place where there's such a sufficiency of water that we can grow crops. And, and again, throughout the Book of Mormon in the Doctrine and Covenants, the, the um, promised land is defined by agriculture, by agricultural productivity. The Pioneer West is an interesting, where, where we're at today, um, in, here in Utah, the settlement of Utah is firmly within a subsidy domain, right? And, and the early church, um, the, the practices um, and the behavior of people were very much influenced by the idea of, we, in order for us to survive, we must live in places where there's um, water brought to us, right? And, and, and Lincoln Ellison, um, is a plant ecologist uh, that, that uh, worked in central Utah in, in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. And, he, and, and I love the, the language of this. The, this comes from one of his scientific articles back when scientists wrote well. Um, <laughs> and, and he says, As surely as a canyon opens upon the valley floor, so surely will one find a farm, a village, or a town. Each of these small islands of civilization is nourished as by a silver umbilical thread from snows that accumulate in the nearby highlands. If it were not for the higher-lying, more humid mountains and the arid, the arid lowlands would never have been settled, and the flourishing and distinctive communities that the traveler p passes through today would not exist. And he was speaking of Manti and Ephraim and Provo and Salt Lake, right? The, 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 each of these places um, along the Wasatch Front is subsidized, right? We're part of this subsidy domain. And what's fascinating is the practice that emerged uh, among the, the early Mormon saints um, because of this, because of living in a place where life was only possible, where, where it's subsidized. Um, and, and Clarence Dutton was a, a surveyor for the USGS, the, one of the... the you know, an outsider um, coming, and he was looking at the geology, but he certainly um, observed the, the people here as well. And, and here's his observation of early Mormons. He says, a village is necessary in order to use the water effectively and economically. Individual rights must be subordinated in an exceptional degree, and the whole community must be under an unusual amount of control. The social unit is no longer the individual, nor even the family, but the village community, right? If you're going to live in a subsidy domain where you're sustained by water from elsewhere, that water must be managed. He goes on to say, Nominally, the bishop is only the pastor of his flock and the agent of the church in matters purely ecclesiastical. In reality, his powers are very great. He controls the occupancy of the land of the village, assigning to each man his field and fixing his allowance of water. And if you speak to anybody in their 70s or 80s who grew up in rural Utah, um, they'll have memories of bishops who served for 25, 30 years, and they weren't just the bishops, but they were also the water master, right? That the, the ecclesiastical office was tied to the allocation of water. So we have this theology that's emerged, right? One that is uh, recognizes a dependence on God of a Sabbath tradition that emerges out of sufficiency. Um, how do we deal with a problem as large as climate change? And, and to, to, to recognize the problems and the vulnerabilities that come for, from climate change, it's interesting to, to think about the, the components of this because not every human community is as vulnerable as others. Not every place is as vulnerable as others. And vulnerability really is a byproduct of three different components. One of them is exposure, right? Climate change is, is, um, is diverse across the landscape. There are some places that will warm more than others, right? The, 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 the Arctic is already warming much more than the tropics. Um, land warms much more than, than the oceans, right? So, so exposure is part of the equation. But exposure alone doesn't determine whether a community is vulnerable to climate change. There's also sensitivity. How much of the, the human economy and human society is sensitive to the outside climate, 
right, to, to, to water availability, to, to temperature. Um, and finally, how adaptable is the community? Is it going to be able to respond to changes in climate? And those three things together speak to an area's vulnerability. And I want to give you a couple of examples. So, so here's the Near East, um, and I'm going to show you some model results. Here's Israel, their average climate um, up until 2004, um, Syria as well. And what you see is that, that both of these countries um, would classically be, fall uh, within the rain-fed domain. Uh, part of it sort of uh, moves over into the, the pastoral, but, 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 but you see a sufficiency of water at least through the fall, fall winter, and spring. Um, summer is miserable there. Um, but when we look at climate change projections, right, so, so the, this is modeled climate, uh, a synthesis. Yeah, that was the right response. For, that this is why we have graphics. Right? Uh, um, what you see, this is why the, the title of my talk is Wandering from the Promised Land. Right? That the climate change is going to drive much of the Middle East out of a place of sufficiency into one of dependency. Right? That, that, that you see Israel moving from a rain-fed agriculture into one where not a single month has a sufficiency of rainfall. Um, Syria, um, uh, while, while the, the projections aren't quite as dire, what you see is that, that it's still um, you know, 10 months out of the year where there's insufficient water. And so we can think about this in terms of this is the exposure. Right? The, the, this is the projection of, of what climate change may do to this region. But how sensitive are they? Right? Whereas Israel has a vibrant agricultural economy, but, but it also is diverse um, and, and, part, and part technological. It, it's got a, a very diverse economy. Um, Syria is much less so. Right? Syria is much more dependent on agriculture, and as such is much more sensitive to changes in climate. And how adaptable are they, right? How much can their economies change and can people change? What are their alternatives? And, and Israel is clearly supported in, in um, much of the world that there are alternatives beyond agriculture that they have uh, and their economy is vibrant enough that they may be able to, to purchase um, food from elsewhere, Syria less so. And so two countries sitting side by side differ really substantially in their vulnerability to climate change. How about the, the Western US, right? And, and so this is what we're seeing right now. Uh, so, so these are some model results by, by some of our, our colleagues at the University of Utah. Um, the, and, and so the, this is a downscaled climate model um, for, for what things will be like in the next 100 years. Um, this shows changes in springtime temperature, and on average here along the Wasatch Front, um, temperatures will be between 4 and 6 degrees Celsius warmer. So what does that mean? Well, when we look at the snowpack, the, the, one of the ways that we measure this is, is it's called um, snow water equivalent. How much water is there tied up in snow? Right? And why does this matter? It matters because we're living in a subsidy domain that we are subsidized by water that's stored in snow, that melts in the spring and summer, that flows into our reservoirs, that feeds our crops that we drink here in Provo. And their model predictions are that the, the change in snow water that will exist in April will be a near 100% decline, right? A near elimination of the snowpack along the Wasatch Front. So what does that mean? And what does it mean in terms of exposure, right? So, so we're exposed to substantially less water that will come late in, in spring and summer. Um, how sensitive are we to it? Well, the, our economy is not entirely agricultural, um, but, um, but at the same time, you know, our lawns are, you know, the water matters, right? Um, and how adaptable are we? And how adaptable are we knowing that the Wasatch Front is likely to increase by 50% in the next 45 years, right? So bring 50% more people, substantially decrease the amount of water that's available. And, and, and we can start to think that, yeah, we're vulnerable to climate change here. Um, 
Climate change is not something that will happen in the future, it's something that's happening right now. And, and this is a really remarkable piece of work that was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. Um, looking at what is happening in this region that, that we're, um, we've been talking about in the Fertile Crescent. And, and just to, to outline this, um, this is year starting in 1900 going to, to 2012. Um, here we have um, change in rainfall in, in the winter. And what you see is that um, is, it's variable. It's exactly what you would expect. Um, uh, but in the last 20 years, there have been one, two, three major periods of reduced rainfall. You add to that a really strong signal of warming, and so, so, so um, temperatures have been increasing. You add those two things together, as we did before, and that's where we get our, uh, the actual manifestation of drought. And so, so this middle panel here is the Palmer Drought Severity Index. Um, minus one is a severe drought, minus three is a, a catastrophic drought. And what you see is, is that in the century before, um, or the 80 years before 1980, um, there was a single drought um, that, that occurred in, in this region, and there have been one, two, three that have occurred in the last 20 years, right? At the same time, the population of Syria has grown really substantially. And so when we talk about Syrian refugees, oftentimes we point to politics. But politics is only a small part of it. The, the, the movement of people out of Syria, in part, in large part, is being driven by aridity by climate change, that the, the, the Syrians are not just political refugees, they are climate refugees as well. So how do we respond? How do we leverage this theology that we have to respond to something like climate change? And I would suggest that the experiences that um, the that the Israelites had in, in the Near East, the experience of early Mormons here in, uh, along the Wasatch Front and in the Intermountain West have taught us the, the things that we need in order to respond to climate change. Um, the, the lesson that, that we derive from the pastoral zone is care for the flock. The lesson from a period of sufficiency is, is the Sabbath. And the lesson from the wilderness and the subsidy domains are faith and interdependence. Right? The, those are the things. And I, and I just want to step through and give you some examples of, of those. Um, so, so this is one of the most amazing places on, on earth. Um, and, and we can draw from lots of early Mormon tradition from, from around the world um, to, to, to see examples of pastoral care. And, and so, so this is on the island of Molokai. Um, and, and on the north shore of the island of Molokai, there, there's this peninsula that, that sticks out. Um, and this is called Kalapapa. And, and on Kalapapa, um, in the, the late, well, mid to late 1800s, King Kamehameha set it aside as a place for lepers. Um, and so they took people who um, were diagnosed with the, the disease or who their neighbor just decided they didn't want them around anymore and said they were leprous. Um, and they sent them to Kalapapa. And, and this was just a, a horrific place, right? It was a place so terrible that when um, the, these displaced peoples um, were sent, um, the, the boats would come in and they would stop uh, 50 meters offshore. And they would just push the people out because they wanted nothing to do with those who resided on Kalapapa. And if you sw could swim, you swam to shore and were abused by those who were already there. And if you couldn't swim, it was almost merciful, right? And, and so, so it, it was a terrible and horrible place. Um, and, and this is the, the seawall that, that protects Kalapapa from the, the rest of the island. It's, you know, 2,000 meters or, or some, some crazy height, and, and there's no way that those who were sent to Kalapapa were completely isolated. And um, one of the, the great early um, Mormon pioneers in Hawaii is a, a man named Jonathan Napella. He helped um, George Q. Cannon translate the Book of Mormon into Hawaiian. He was a man of great stature, um, a, a landowner, a very influential person. And, and when his wife Kitty was diagnosed with, with um, leprosy, um, she was sent to Kalapapa. And this man of great stature and wealth said, I will give it all up 
to care for her. And his last Sunday in Laie, um, he was sustained as the branch president on Kalapapa, put on a boat, and he and Kitty sailed off um, for the island for Molokai. Um, and while he was there, he brought order and with Father Damien and worked closely with other members of other faiths, with, with Father Damien and others, um, to, to bring order to Kalapapa, to, to make it a place of refuge and, and to support those who are sick and, and, um, and, and, both, and Jonathan Napella and Father Damien and others have gone down in the history as, as some of the most important people of sacrificing and of giving their time and talents for, for those who were displaced um, for, be, because of, of leprosy. And we see this emerging today, right? That, that one of the clearest examples of pastoral care that we have is the new LDS I Was a Stranger initiative, right? That, that one of the responses that we have to have for climate change is to care for those who have just been displaced, right? Um, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is concerned about the temporal and spiritual welfare of all of God's children across the earth with special concern for those who are fleeing physical violence, war, and religious persecution. The church urges all people and governments to cooperate fully in seeking the best solutions to meet human needs and relieve suffering. The, the, I think some people worry that the church, the LDS church hasn't come out with a strong statement regarding climate change. And I would suggest they have, right? The, and they have in that they are responding to, to many of the, the, the most negative consequences of climate change as they, they seek um, to, to help refugees. And, and the, this um, quote from, from Elder Kieran, I think is really profound. It says, the savior knows how it feels to be a refugee. He was one. As a child, Jesus and his family fled to Egypt to escape the murderous swords of Herod. And at various points in his ministry, he found himself threatened and his life in danger, ultimately submitting to the designs of evil men who had plotted his death. Perhaps then it is all the more remarkable to us that he repeatedly taught us to love one another, to love as he loves, to love our neighbor as ourselves, right? The ultimate manifestation of pastoral care. Uh, of reaching out for those who have been displaced um, and, and caring for them. Um, the Sabbath, right? The, the, the Sabbath is this really profound doctrine that, that is being emphasized Sunday after Sunday um, in our, our sacrament meetings and, and elsewhere. And, and the Sabbath is tied to a principle of sufficiency, right? That when there is sufficient, you can set aside. And, and um, I think one of the most profound um, doctrines that we have co comes from Doctrine and Covenants 59. And it's, it's a fascinating section in the scriptures in part because it's often read in two different ways, right? Oftentimes we either read it for its Sabbath teachings, which are the first half, or for its environmental teachings, which are the second half. But I think what we need to begin to do is read it in its totality, because its totality is that the Sabbath and the environment are inextricably linked, right? And so it says, Behold, blesses, saith the Lord, they are they who have come up into this land with an eye single to my glory. Yea, blessed are they whose feet stand upon the land of Zion, right? The promised land, the land of sufficiency, who have obeyed my gospel, for they shall receive for their reward the good things of the earth, and it shall bring forth in its strength, right? Again, this idea of promised land and sufficiency are tied um, so closely together, and then we can ask, because it comes up several times in this chapter, or in this section, what are the good things of the earth? And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. The good things of the earth are everything, right? That, that as they enter Zion, they're promised the blessings of the entire earth. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, right? Recognizing the goodness of the earth and the Sabbath day go hand in hand, beginning in Genesis and continuing into the, the Doctrine and Covenants, because it was in... It, he had rested from all his work which God created and made. 
And Wendell Berry um, recognizes the importance of this, sort of the goodness of the earth and its connection to the Sabbath. And he says, the world, once it was made, was not complete in the sense that it was done or finished. It was complete because it was whole. Its maker had so filled it with living creatures, so invested with his spirit and breath that it could keep on working. It could live on its own while he rested. It was an active and ongoing wholeness. And so maybe it is through proper practice of the Sabbath that we begin to recognize the earth in its wholeness, in its totality. Um, and it says, and that thou mayest more fully keep thyself unspotted from the world, thou shalt go to the house of prayer and offer up thy sacraments on my holy day. For verily, this is the day appointed for you to rest from your labors, to pay thy devotions to the Most High. And on this day thou shalt do none other things, only let thy food be prepared with singleness of heart. Isn't that fascinating, right? That the, the experience um, through these biophysical domains was one so often tied to food, right? And here again we see the proper practice of the Sabbath focuses on food and diet. It says, um, let thy food be prepared with singleness of heart, that thy fasting may be perfect, or in other words, that thy joy may be full. So how in the world can fasting lead to joy, right? This is the ultimate um, paradox. And it is that as we willingly give up, right, as we practice weekly what the Sabbath year suggests, right? Willingly giving up something for the good of others that our joy is made full, in part because it teaches us something about the creation, uh, about the goodness of God. And it says, verily, this is fasting and prayer, or in other words, rejoicing in prayer. Verily, I say that inasmuch as you do this, the fullness of the earth is yours, that by sacrificing what we can consume, the fullness of the earth becomes ours. We receive it in all of its goodness. We begin to recognize God's love in every component of the world around us. The beasts of the field and the fowls of the air and that which climbeth upon the trees and walketh upon the earth. And Norman Wurzba, who, who spoke earlier in, in this seminar, um, he says, as we experience creation with greater depth and with finer detail, we encounter a world sustained by God's love and care. The call to delight is a call to embrace the whole world, even its unpleasant parts and moments, and find there the love of God at work, right? The proper practice of the Sabbath allows us to recognize the, the creation in its wholeness and the goodness and see in it the love of God. And it motivates us to do the right thing. Um, it motiv motivates us towards practice. And then it goes on to say, Yea, all things which come of the earth and the season thereof are made for the benefit and use of man, both to please the eye and gladden the heart. Right. So in proper Sabbath practice, we begin to recognize the blessings of the world around us. All things that come of the earth are made for the benefit and use of man to please the eye and gladden the heart, right? The first thing that it acknowledges is not the consumptive element of it, but in the, the way that it builds our spirit. Yea, for food, for raiment, for taste, for spell, to strengthen the body and to enliven the soul. And it pleaseth God that he hath given all these things unto man, for unto this end were they made to be used with judgment, not to excess, neither by extortion. The proper practice of the Sabbath teaches us the great sin of abusing the, the creation, right? Because why would we abuse this gift that comes of God's love? And, and 21 is just so profound in the context of the experience of the Israelites, where they were sustained by the subsidy in the riverine zone. They were sustained as they passed through the, the wilderness. Um, they were taught in the pastoral zone, and finally they received sufficiency. And so you can imagine what God thinks when people fail to recognize his hand in things. He says, And in nothing doth man offend God, or against none is his wrath kindled, save those who confess not his hand in all things, all things being the goodness of the creation. Right? To not recognize God's hand in the creation offends him, and obey not his commandments. And what Norman Wurzba said is that Sabbath frames our entire life, helping us set priorities and determine which of our activities and aspirations bring honor to God. Right? Ultimately, through proper practice of the Sabbath, we begin to, to, to change our behaviors, and we, would, we 
begin to recognize those things that, that say would contribute to climate change that we should do differently. And, and just a, as a little side story that um, uh, I was well into to my career as a plant ecologist um, and I began to recognize that, that my interaction with the world around me um, was very much economical. Right? That, that I would, I've got the best job in the world. I can go anywhere I want and study anything I want in the most remarkable places ever. Um, and what I was doing is I would travel to the Mojave Desert, I would collect data, I would write them down, put them in the computer, whatever, get back in the car and drive back here. I'd drive to the summits of the mountains, collect data, come back, and never really appreciate what I was doing, right? Never appreciate um, the, the world around me. And, and so when I was about 40, I decided to take up photography, right? Because it, it was in photography that I found the manifestation, manifestation of this Sabbath view of the creation, that it forced me to stop and think and see the beauty and the delicacy, uh, the, how detailed um, the, the, the world is and how amazing and remarkable it is. And, and so uh, I was doing all the, this research that taught me about the world, but it was in photography that the Sabbath emerged. And, 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 and so, so all of the pictures in, in this presentation were taken in the last seven years as I began to, to celebrate God's creation again. So finally, we get to this idea of subsidy independence, right? Ultimately, we need to recognize that life is possible only because we live on an earth that is subsidized by God's grace, right? And, and um, just, uh, just last month, Elder Oak spoke at BYU Hawaii's graduation. And he spoke uh, about the challenging times that we face, and um, he spoke of the role of faith. And, and I would invite you all to, to read the, his entire talk, but, but, but I loved the, um, what he had to say. He said, these are challenging times filled with big worries, wars and rumors of wars, possible epidemics of infectious disease, droughts, floods, and global warming, right? So, so, so I don't know if this is the first time an apostle has spoken about climate change, but it, it, it's in the first few, right? Seacoast cities are concerned with the rising level of the ocean, which will bring ocean tides to their doorsteps or over their thresholds. Global warming is also affecting agriculture and wildlife. We're even challenged by the politics of conflict and the uncertainty sponsored by the aggressive new presidential administration in the world's most powerful nation. Don't be part of the worldly attitude described in the characterization of your generation as the me generation interested only in what, what's in it for me. Always be willing to cooperate and even sacrifice in cooperative efforts for the benefit of the largest community. Right? This is the ultimate manifestation of this subsidy mentality. Right? That it isn't a world filled with individuals, but a world filled with a community of people who need to work collectively to solve the great problems of today, including climate change. So, so ultimately, a dry land theology can shape the way that we respond to climate change. We can look to pastoral care, right, that ultimately the, that our response needs to be filled with love and care for those who are most vulnerable. Right? whether it be, be those who have been displaced by climate disasters or those in our own communities who are least able to respond. Um, it's shaped by recognizing that the, the vast majority of us live in conditions of sufficiency and sacrifice will be required of us. And it could be a Sabbath sacrifice, right? If we set aside one-seventh of our effort to, to recognize the goodness of the environment and the creation around us and, and do what we can to, to stop its damage, the world would be a better place. And, and ultimately recognize that the entire world is sustained in an environment of subsidy and interdependence, and that we need to recognize that interdependence and work collectively to solve problems. And with that, I'd love to take any questions that you have. Yeah, if you want to come to the mic, they're recording it. Oh. Sorry. Oh, 
So a lot of what you talked about was about mitigating, you know, the results of climate change, working with climate refugees and being willing to, you know, to, to deal with the consequences of our actions, essentially. What steps would you like to see taken to, you know, mitigate the results beforehand to try and reduce the damages of climate change? Right. No, I think it's a fascinating question. And, and, and it ultimately comes down to, to this idea that, that while climate change occurs, we, we must support those that, that are being impacted, right, who, who are vulnerable now. Um, but some of this does influence the, the degree of climate change that, that we have, right, that, that if we truly embrace a Sabbath view of, of the world, um, well, well, it's at its most basic. One, one of my favorite um, uh, recommendations, commandments from modern prophets uh, that we choose to ignore is, is that President Kimball in the 1970s suggested that everybody park their cars on Sunday, right? That, that, that we walk to church where it's practical. And, and imagine, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a pretty remarkable thing to, to, to imagine. What if we reduced our travel impacts on climate by one-seventh by walking instead of driving, right? That, that there's no reason why our chapels need the, the parking lots that we have if we followed the, the advice of the prophet. So, 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 so I think that, that, that that's it. it but, but ultimately, I, I think we need to, to begin to work collectively, right? That, that we're in a, a political environment right now where so much of what we're doing is focused on sort of what's in it for me, right? We hear this rhetoric all the time, and I, I think that with issues this large, we need to begin acting collectively to, to reduce greenhouse gases. Okay. Yeah. Hey, thanks for your remarkable presentation. Uh, this is kind of a small technical question, but I was just wondering, uh, with those diagrams you had, if that was a, a tool that was available online or if that was just something you did. The, it, it's a, so, so uh, the visualization of climate change predictions is, is um, getting much more accessible than it is now. And, and so, so the data, uh, so, so I, I made the, the graphs that, that that's not yeah. rocket science. Um, the, the data are, are what matters the most. And, and the USGS has produced um, a climate change visual, visualization tool that has taken um, sort of the the, the latest effort to synthesize multiple models to, to get reasonable predictions. And you can actually do it county by county now, right? And, and so, so, so if, you, if you just look at the CHMP5 um, uh, data visualization, if you Google that, the USGS viewer will come up and, and it'll show you. You can go and say, what's Box Elder County gonna look like in 50 years? What about the Walter, what was it called? Walter Leith. Yeah. yeah the, 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 some of those, uh, many of those are available. The, the, um, a lot of the time, uh, weather sites, if you look up a local climate, it'll show it. Yeah. Thank so. you. So I'm wondering about um, this, uh, I mean, if, Prior to climate change, you have you have those different um, uh, what did you call them biophysical domains, right? Mm -hmm. And the imaginary of that theology is projected onto God's care and our dependence on Him. And there's so many biblical connections made between our righteousness and our obedience, and then God's willingness to provide the subsidy or to provide uh, the pastoral care. I mean, it's not as if there's no responsibility on the part of humans, um, but, but there's a, it's much, it's very heavily directed towards God's sovereignty. But once climate change gets introduced into the system, then you have changes in the climate that no longer are correlated in the same way anyway. I mean, maybe they still are correlated, but they're they're correlated in a different way to how we behave. Um, and I think that's one reason why a lot of Christians, um, James Inhofe being probably the most famous of them, who've said, I can't even accept that climate change is possible. It's not that he not only denies that it's happening, but in theological terms, he says it's not even 
possible. And he quotes Genesis um, where God is promising Noah that he will protect the seasons or preserve, make seasons and seasonal change will remain with the earth as long as, as, as the Lord wills it. So I'm wondering what your response to that would be. I mean, because what you're saying, um, I'm, I just want you to spell out that complicating factor now, because, I mean, you could go either way with that. You could be a theological-oriented person who simply denies climate change is happening, or you could be someone who says, hey, this whole thing is our fault, and there's n it's foolish to depend on God any longer, that model's thrown out too because all that's done is made us passive in the face of our own um, mistakes of our own making. And so it's time to just grow up and be responsible for the earth since we are in fact now affecting it to the point where we're thinking of renaming our geological era as the Anthropocene. So what would, what would your response to that so, be? So, so I think that that's a fantastic question. And, and First, I would suggest that, that the lessons that the Israelites learned, they didn't learn in place and wait for God to teach them, right? They, they didn't sort of have the, the singular experience, hey, I'm going to sit here and God's going to teach me pastoral care, and then he's going to teach me sufficiency, and then he's going to teach me, teach me that, right? That, that, in fact, it was their own efforts in being guided by, by God that, that, that the, the biophysical context didn't change for the benefit of Humanity, humanity was uh, was led through the, this experience from place to place and, and being taught, and, and so so I would suggest that that first of all, God doesn't just sort of by His own whim change climate to benefit the people that are sitting there, right? That in fact the people had to move to receive the benefit and the tutelage that, that was required of them. Second is that certainly uh, within LDS theology, when you hear about the, the earth providing for the benefit and use of man, right? That ultimately the, there is a caveat attached to that is so long as you don't use it to excess, neither by extortion. And, and the degree to which we don't receive those benefits is a reflection of the degree to which we are using them to excess and to extortion, right, and by extortion. And, and so, so I would suggest that, that, that there isn't this promise that the world will always be a benign place because God loves us, right, that, that God will teach us and he will teach us not by necessarily keeping the climate in one place really benign, right, the, and so, so, so I, I think that the Ultimately, there is a feedback, right? That, that it, we, we st started with ecology is either how religion understands the environment, the environment under, uh, influences religion, but, but ultimately it leads to a feedback, right? There has to be a feedback that, that the environment as it responds to our religious practice feeds back to that environment, right? And, and it's, it's not unidirectional, but rather a feedback. And, and so I would suggest that, that those who would say God will take care of us and we will do whatever we want don't appreciate the fact that, that, that we have a personal responsibility as well. Uh, you mentioned water adaptability in your presentation today. And my question is, what water adaptability methods do you see in the future? And if theology plays a role in that and how it can play a role in that? It's a great question. It's one that's really fun. To, to, I'm part of a, a research group um, between Utah State, the U, and BYU that's really looking into the next 50 years of water sustainability here. And, and the, the sort of coupled issues that, that we're dealing with are um, first, a changing climate, will, which will change the amount of water a growing human population here uh, along the Wasatch Front, and how do you meet those needs? And, and it comes down to this idea of adaptability. And one of the, the um, big areas that, that we're looking to is the engineered environment, right? Trying to, to figure out first, you know, to, to minimize water loss um, uh, within the, the human system, right? So, so can we engineer our water delivery system so that, that we're less wasteful? Um, changing our obsession with lawns, right? The, 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 it, it, so Utah's the, the, um, the second driest state in the U.S., and yet we've, we live like we are in Kentucky. 
And the reason why is because we're subsidized. We concentrate water in these mountains and we bring it and we, we water our lawns or we plant these incredible forests. And, and one of my students, Ann Thomas, we, we just had a paper published looking at how the choices that we make in the trees that we plant influences the ultimate water budget of the city. Right? So, so being much more informed about that, being able to, to recognize um, how, how we can work collectively towards a sustainable model. Um, and and so, so, so I think that, that there are some approaches that, that are out there as we, we transition to new technologies, make decisions about landscaping and, and personal behavior. Um, in terms of whether or not I think there, there's a, a theological um, Imperative. Well, I, so I would say there's a theological imperative, right? That, that we're not going to care for those additional people we're adding to um, the, this community if we can't figure it out, right? And, and so, so there's lots of, of reasons we need to respond and that we should make choices about water use, being motivated as spiritual people who recognize that, that the way that we use water is, is a reflection of our understanding of God's love for us. Um, but, but I think that this is a place where there's some really fun engineering and science going on.